Well, you've waited all week. <clears throat> Let's go at First John chapter 1, verse 8, and reveal. When he says, if you're walking in the light, you're all good. Don't walk in the darkness, you're all bad. Well, uh, he doesn't define it there, but he will. We're getting into it, all right? Hang in there. Glad that you're with us on this journey. As we go through the books of the New Testament in the order in which they were written, we're in First John, an amazing book. If you haven't listen to part one of this you really need to <clears throat> I, I put minutes of effort into that plus it, it sets up the book you ready if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us hold the fort what's going on he's just said if we have fellowship with him we walk in a light but if we walk in a darkness we're lying and we don't live by the truth He's talking about the human condition. There, the King James Version is a pretty good translation of a not terribly great text. At the time, it was the best text they had. We have found so much older text, more complete, more reliable since the King James date. And that's not knocking the King James. You can get to heaven with the King James quite easily, and a lot of folk have. Not so easily, perhaps, if you don't know Shakespearean style English, mind, but it's it's a great Bible, not dissonant. In fact, there are a couple of things in the King James that I kind of wish we still had in modern English. One of them we make fun of. It's the uths. Believeth. You know, thou goeth. Well, there is a reason for the uths. We used to have different letters in our alphabet, too, that have gone away. And that's, um, that's a pity. We could have used a thorn and some other of those old English uh, drawings, but I, but I digress, which I tend to do. <clears throat> in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It's brilliant. Some of the other versions, will, um, I'm sorry, manuscripts will say from every sin. Same thing. But the key thing here is in the King James Version, it'll say cleanseth us from all sins. Why is the uth important? Because the uth indicates a, an, a verb that has continual action. So it didn't say he cleansed us from all sin. Let's say at our faith or at our baptism. No, he cleanseth us. So when people ask me if I'm saved, I say yes, and I'm still being saved. Because it's not just an event, it's a process. And Jesus with us cleanses us, which is extremely important. Because as we talked about last week, we have darkness in us. He does not have darkness in him. We do not have light, but we can reflect the light of Jesus. And we talked about that again last week, but the, the whole point here is, you might have felt, let's say after your baptism, let's say you were immersed you came up out of the water and you felt super clean, which, which you were. You absolutely were. And then through the years, you might have picked up a few barnacles on your voyage. And you're going, ah, oh, I want to be better. Brilliant. Work on that. Work on that. But one thing you don't have to worry about is Jesus. Jesus' blood continually cleanses. It's, it's not something that you have to stop in your day and go and ask and you know, go through these different acts of penance. No, you have Jesus, you're saved. Now act like it and walk in the light. So he says, by the way, if anybody's out there going, well, that doesn't apply to me because I've been forgiven and I'm clean. And there are some religious groups that try to teach that we can be totally holy, totally pure. And I don't know what species of people these are and with whom they've been interacting, but I've not met a person yet. Even my most hallowed wife and my, my grands who are totally pure, totally holy. No, if they could be, they wouldn't need a savior. Jesus does this for us. So if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we have to admit 
you know, first step is admitting you've got a problem. You've heard this before, right? And it's very true. I follow a young man on Twitter <clears throat> just because he popped up in my feed some time ago. And I really, I just, I found him engaging. And you may find him on Twitter as well. But here's a man that realized he had let his life go wrong. And he was over 400 pounds. And he said, you know, I did this to myself. I can, I can fix this. And so he goes on Twitter to be held accountable, which, you know, there's the good and the bad there, <clears throat> but he's already lost over a hundred pounds and he's doing it with the hard work. But the first thing is he had to look in the mirror one day and say, I'm too big. I need to correct this. Or maybe you're going to get a doctor's report. He says, Patrick, you got too much fat in your blood, too much cholesterol. You're going to need to do this. Not going to happen unless Patrick says, I've got a problem. Or you, um, you've been unhappy at your church forever and you've been unhappy at the next church. Maybe it's time to find a different way to go to church, like what we're doing here. Or maybe it's time for you to change who you are and your expectations. But it all starts with saying, I have a problem and I want to fix it. So one of the first things we have to admit is that we are all sinners. So what happens next? Verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Two different things there. You're being forgiven, huge, big benefit. But the longer you walk with the light, the less you want the darkness. The more you walk with God, the less you want evil. It's just one of those things. <clears throat> if you're part of a religion that's based upon do's and don'ts, this does not apply. This only applies if you're part of a religion that's based on a relationship with Jesus, the Messiah, the very image of God. And you know your gospels and you want to live that way. That will actually tamp down your appetite for the other stuff. It's amazing does work. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So once again, it's like a multi-stack Oreo cookie, which uh, I don't know why they just don't leave Oreos alone. They seem to have been all right since they basically ripped off Hydrox. But um, if you didn't know that, look it up. It's a fascinating story if, if you're easily amused. But you know, now they got to turn them different colors and double stack them and all the other. Okay, fine. Good. You know, who am I to argue? It's stacked in there. He purifies us, but remember, we, we do sin. He is pure. Remember, we are not. He's constantly pulling us back to Jesus as the focus. Sometimes some of the other books that he would have read, because his are among the last read. He, you see a lot of focus on behavior, law, theology, history. And all of that is very, very good. So, but he wants to fill in that gap because he's John. That's what he did with the gospel. That's what he's doing here. And call us back to, yeah, walk with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Get closer to Jesus. Now, chapter 2, <clears throat> which remember was not chapter 2 to him. There weren't divisions. He's just continuing. My dear children, he says this because he's old at this stage. Late 80s. Some say early 90s. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But he just said we do. Yep. He's just trying to make us better. I'll prove it. Little children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But, he says, if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for us, not for our sins. Now, hang on. You ready? Are you wearing your seat belts? Are your tray tables in their upright and locked position? And not only for ours, but for the whole world. There are a lot of passages in the New Testament and in the Old, which read pure universalism, some form or the other of universalism. And here he says, not, you know, it's for everybody. 
And then you always get those people, yeah, it's for them, but they're never going to get there because they, they, it's, it's a little hard to say for the whole world and not mean it, especially when you're talking about something this weighty and remembering that there are a good proportion of this world that will never hear the name of Jesus. And if they do hear his name, they'll never hear one of his stories. They'll never encounter a Christian. Did Jesus die for them? You bet you did. Was his, his death for them in vain? No. John believes that. So do I. He goes on. But we know that... Oh, okay. Definition time. We've got definitions. It's so good. We know that we have come to know him. You know what? Drum roll. If we obey his commands. Okay. There we go. Because I get that one thrown at me sometimes. They'll say things like, well, why doesn't your church organize like this? And why does your church allow women to speak? Uh, why does your church, you know, take the Lord's Supper this way? And why does your church use instruments? And it's, and I'll say, we're just focused on Christ. And somebody will grab this one. Like, like it's in a holster. And it's a little knife they've hidden on their person. They've secreted upon their person. They, whoop, they'll whip it out. But if you love Christ, you'd obey his commands. And I always say, okay, show me where he commanded anything to say about that. Well, Paul and James and then Augustine and then Thomas and hold on, hold on. Jesus's commands. Well, that means the whole Bible. Really? Really? Hmm. There's some commands in the Old Testament. I bet you don't think we ought to do now. Like going into that town, killing all the people, farming out the women as slaves. Yeah. Is that Jesus' command too? And then you find that they've devised their own cafeteria style religion where I'll take a bit of that, a bit of that, not having that. And with this, we're going to mix it, make something new. They're not taking the whole package, the gestalt, this uh, holistic approach. What were Jesus' commands? Do you remember? He was asked. A young man came up to him and said, what's the most important thing? God said, I don't know, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And he said, and the second command is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, these two commands is all of the prophets. This is all what it comes to. Well, those are the commands. And so when I say welcome home to you, I mean it. Even if right now you're nursing a hangover or you've been three years sober until 10 minutes ago. Welcome home. Even if you've been divorced three times and you're thinking a fourth one's coming, welcome home. Even if you've shamed yourself in a variety of ways, welcome home. You see, I don't do that because I'm a nice guy. I do it because I have a king and my king has a kingdom and he controls the gates and he swings them open and says, welcome home. I'll take care of the sin. Okay then. I was once at a church and I cannot give details because I did not ask permission. <clears throat> I've been there for some time and we knew we, we attracted some troubled individuals. Well, that's what we wanted to do. Somebody leaned over and said, Patrick, we need you in the lobby, in the foyer, or whatever they called it. Someone out and there is a young man. I'll call him John. That wasn't his name. And he was um, pacing and crying and there's a bit of snot and such. And I went over and I said, John, what's going on? And he said, I've been good. I've been, I've been really good. And I said, yes, we've been quite proud of the work you've been putting in. He smelled like the weekend. You could tell there had been a problem. And he'd slipped and he had... Done, done it all. And he says, I can't come in. I said, are you, are you kidding, John? You're the very people Jesus did all this for. You're, you're the person. He, he didn't do it for those that think they just need saved a wee bit. He, he did it for you. Let's go. Come sit by me. Well, at this church, we, uh, we, would, we took the Lord's Supper every Sunday, the Eucharist communion. But we did it at separate tables so that people would go to tables and you'd have that little fellowship and we hug there that you, you might not have gotten otherwise. 
But we also had a rule, and that was if somebody has mobility issues, they should stay sat and just raise their hand and make eye contact. Well, we're at a table, John's there, he's sniffing, he's, and his eye looks over and he sees a woman several rows back who, who signals that she can't get up there. He grabs the bread and the tray of, uh, of, of the juice at this church and heads out there. And that's one of the happiest memories of my life. Because when somebody who smells like the weekend and has just fallen, is just coming back to the Lord, knows that they can serve communion. You're in a good place. Be in that place. John wants you in that place. He is the atoning sacrifice. We know, we know we've come to obey. We know him. We know we know him. John, you're not making this easy. We know we know him if we obey his commands. And now you know what the commands are. Love God, love your neighbor. All in. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know that we are in him. Now the drum roll, John's gonna do this to you a lot. You wanna know you're in him? Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Oh, but none of us do. None of us are ever gonna to rise to that. So are we all sunk? No. That's why he started with that whole, we all have sin, but Jesus purifies us, stay in the light. We're always gonna to have to correct. We're always. Always. Have you seen a little kid get behind the wheel of a car and pretend they're driving? Now this is a whole lot easier, kids, way back in the day when you didn't have steering wheel locks. And so kids could swing that wheel through wide arcs. Now it's just, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, so it kind of kills the moment there. But if you get them one of those little play cars so they can, and oh, they will just swing that wheel back and forth. I think kids might know something more about journeying than we do. Well, they are called toddlers because they will kind of bounce around as they're going like through a pinball. Uh, that's really what life does to us. And we always need course corrections. I recently drove through Kansas twice, east to west, west to east. That was, um, it's a long ride. And it's not always, you know, people always make it out to be super boring. And I've done that too, because you join in the joke. but. It's not so flat that you can just put on the cruise control, get in the back, make a sandwich. No, always course corrections. There's wind, there's the way the road sits, it's your tires. There's the rotation of your engine. If, you, if you're using combustible fuel, uh, that's gonna have some torque there. It's gonna pull you a little bit. All of these things, passing vehicles, create a wake of wind, always, <coughs> always, adjusting that's what life is but if you're always adjusting don't get tired because you're doing the right thing you're adjusting you're you've not gone to God and said this is it this is all I can do you know I gotta love me for being me who I am right now and that's just the way well really um you can love yourself and tell yourself but there's room for improvement <laughs> let's make an adjustment here as my wife and I get older we have to make adjustments uh, about not only, well, about everything. What do we eat? Well, you know, sometimes when you get to a certain age, you don't burn as many calories as you used to. So the eating needs to adjust. Either the amounts or what you're eating, that needs to change. The same with um, you know, working around the house. I told my wife 10 years ago, this yard was smaller. And she laughed because she knows what I meant by that. I'm, I think I'm the only person in our entire neighborhood who mows with a push mower. Other people get up on these big expensive um, tractor thingies and they're going and then stopping and I'm going, yeah, really? And so I don't know what we have. It's probably not even a fifth of an acre, but it is like this and I'm pushing and I'm saying, I didn't used to have to stop and rest during this. But we know what it is. You make you make adjustments. I'm not gonna buy the tractor. This is, I don't go to the gym. I mow the lawn once or twice a week. In Tennessee, 
you can mow it twice and still be behind the curve. Um, we make adjustments and we, we love going to Nashville soccer games. Um, Nashville Soccer Club is our team. But they built that beautiful stadium on top of quite a, quite a hill. Uh, my wife has mobility issues, so we have to, man have to manage the way we get in and out of that. Is that a problem? No, it's called life. You adjust, you move. You might be in a relationship that you need to adjust. You might be in a church you need to adjust. You might be messing with finances and need to make an adjustment. Make adjustments knowing that God is with you and he is cleansing you of your sins. He's on your side. He proved that. Then he goes, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. This old command is a message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. There's a story behind this. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. John's saying, kids, because <coughs> to him, Everybody was younger, and they were his children in Christ as well. He taught them. He's saying, you're getting better. You're doing fine. Recently, one of my kids, and of course they're grown up, they're adults, had a pretty important birthday. It was one of those numbers that when it clicks over, it, people dread approaching. Some people hit 39 and just keep it 39 for a long time. Well, the odometer goes over a certain number, and they... Um, they ask us to do little videos for her. And uh, my response was, I'm, I'm amazed at who you are. I'm amazed at how, you, what you've done, what you're doing, where you're going. I, I, I think it's fine to have pride in saying, wow, I can see the light in your eyes. I can see Jesus shining through you. Well, that's what we want, isn't it? So how can Jesus shine in this situation? is a question that we should ask ourselves very, very frequently. And then as John does, John likes to do uh, two sides. Uh, and so like that sin, purity, if you say you have sin, don't have sin, it, it does that. So as soon as he says we're shining like light, you know what comes next. Verse nine, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother, okay, now, now, we're getting closer to understanding what it means to be in light or darkness. Remember, we follow Jesus' commands. What are they? Love God, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Jesus showed us it was even the Samaritan. So the person on earth that you look upon as being your greatest enemy, whether it's an individual or group. Um, when I was a wee boy, it was always the USSR. Soviet Union was coming through for us through the Fulda Gap. In Germany, they were gonna fire the the missiles over the poles, it was all over. So it might be them. You know, my, it might be that you're, you're, you know, you fought in some wars and therefore you don't have a high opinion of people in Iran or Iraq or the like. You need to realize Jesus picked the Samaritan on purpose. He picked the person that everyone there would look upon as an enemy and says, love them because they're your neighbor. It's, um, it's a big calling, but you're being called to do this, all right? So if you hate your brother, you're still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. He's gonna keep doing this. And there's nothing in him to make him stumble. It's, um, it's a little odd phrasing. So let's look at that a bit closer, shall we? Anyone who hates to be in the, who claims to be in the light but hates his brother, is still in the darkness. Okay, so sort that out, make adjustments. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness. Oh, let's go back verse 10, sorry. Whoever lives, loves his brother lives in the light and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. We really need to quit saying I couldn't help it. Really. I've had people lose their temper, and then when they saw that I was witnessing it, kind of shut me, you know, oh, I'm sorry, you know. My uh, stepbrother's cousin's uncle what knew, knew a fellow what he shook hands with who was Irish, and so I just lose my temper. No, no. You don't lose your temper because you're Irish. 
You don't get mad because you're Italian. You don't do anything because of it. You do it because you made a decision. Even, even addiction, and man, I, my heart breaks for people addicted. There are decisions that you're making. If you need help in a community, if you need to, to be locked away for a wee bit in a treatment center, whatever it takes, make those adjustments. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to, you don't want to have something in you that you can then say, well, that made me stumble. And here's something which I really don't want to go into great detail in. Um, well, you, therapists know this. Every therapist listening here, they know this, they can back it up. Women who are abused, very often the husband will say, I just did it because I was drunk. Men do not abuse women because they drank. They drank so they could abuse women. They drink to give themselves permission to act out of order. I told you we, we go to Nashville soccer games. On the way out, some people have been overserved. It's not a huge problem, but some have. And they are loud and they are moving. And it's like, listen to us. We are having fun very loudly. Our volume is high. We are enjoying our volume. And they drink so they can act like that. They don't act like that so they can drink. That's a really big, important thing. So what are we putting into our, our lives that then give us the excuse to sin? Got to make some adjustments. Whoever hates his brothers in the darkness, he walks around in the darkness. He doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. Okay. I'm not going to be able to get into the next verses yet. So I'm going to remind you of a story that I told maybe a year or so ago. It wasn't long back in America. And a fellow asked me if I would go with him on a visit somewhere. And I said, oh, right, sure. So he's driving. And a fellow in a very expensive, one of those that, you know, will never buy a sports car, pulled in front of him, cutting him off. I mean, he had to slam on his brakes and he sounded his horn and the man just flipped his finger at us and laughed and drove off. Well, my friend was very upset. You know, how can he? And I don't know, those wretch toffs and this, that and the other. And about 15 minutes later in the ride, he was still not happy. And I looked at him and I said, how long have you known that fella? He looked, he said, I don't know him. I said, oh, I just assumed you knew him because you invited him into your life for the last 15 minutes. Why would you do that? Sitting here seething is not going to fix anything about that fella. He doesn't even know about you. He doesn't care. He's gone. He did not invite you into his life. Why are you carrying him around? You don't get to see anything. You don't get to have any joy in the moment because you're too busy hating. And of course, people say, no, no, I don't hate. Well, prove it then. Drop them. Don't let them live in your head. You see, the people that live in your head, you're giving free rent to these people. Don't do that. There's no need for that. Make adjustments. Well, speaking of adjustments, we have to stop because we're trying to keep these to 30 minutes. Let me know what you would like to do next as, as we begin to wrap this up. Uh, some want to go through the Old Testament not so much in the order it was written, but in chunks and concepts and kind of how it unfolded. Others would like for me to walk through the Gospels telling the stories. I love doing that as well. So info at rsafeharbor.com. Also, let us know where you live and that you'd like to be on the map so that as I'm traveling about the US and Canada, that maybe I can stop and outland Mexico. Maybe I can stop and see you. I'd love to do that. Thank you for being here. God bless. Cheers.